Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David, and I uh, realize that sometimes I mention uh, things from church history, like Martin Luther, or you'll hear me say the Protestant Reformation or indulgences, and why would you know what any of those things are, right? I mean, why would you? None of you had uh, Dr. Bantu's class on church history in seminary. Uh, I still have a hard time remembering American history, like the fact that Washington crossed the Delaware on Christmas Day, or that the Boston Tea Party had nothing to do with tea. <laughs> so what is it with Luther and the Reformation, and what are indulgences? Well, the first indulgence started in the 11th century with Pope Urban II. And what the Pope wanted to do was reward anyone who signed up to enlist in the Crusades. And what I guess an indulgence was, was a piece of paper that basically said, the bearer of this document is released from past sins. They're forgiven, right? And so basically the church said, if you go and fight the war, if you go fight in the Crusades, then your reward will be, God will eliminate all your past sin, you'll be forgiven, and this is the church's stamp of approval. I don't know why anybody would need that, right? I mean, to us here in 2023, it sounds ridiculous, but back then, uh, it, they were popular because people were worried about purgatory. Purgatory was, we'll call it sinner jail. It's basically uh, similar to Charles Dickens, how he depicts Jacob Marley. Jacob Marley in A Christmas Carol, he comes back weighted down with chains, and he says that he is being punished in the afterlife for sins in this life. And they're in a holding pattern, and they have to serve out their term before they can get full access to heaven. So an indulgence was basically time served. It, it took time off your sentence in heaven jail. Now, I don't know how this piece of paper worked. If you had to be buried with it, or you had to be holding it when you died, I'd really hate to get to heaven and be, you know, patting my pockets going, I swear I had it right here. But then, in 1347, the Black Death killed 200 million people in three years. And for the church, when you lose 60% of your congregation, all of a sudden, your church is also losing 60% of its tithes. And all of this taking place during a massive building campaign. So when you're in leadership, you gotta think creatively. I know, let's bring back indulgences. So now everyone, not just soldiers, they could buy their way out of purgatory, or you could act as sort of a bail bondsman and you could buy somebody else's release out of purgatory. And the, the priests even turned it into a little rhyme. They said, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And this is what everybody believed for about 170 years. That is until we see Martin Luther. He's a German monk. He's teaching theology at the University of Wittenberg. And at the same time he's teaching, he's also translating the Latin Bible into German. And he's a good Catholic. He would never dream of defying the church or defying its teachings until he starts translating the book of Romans. Romans is the sixth book in the New Testament. Uh, it's the longest of the letters of Paul. Paul wrote this letter to the Romans uh, from Corinth before the end of his uh, third missionary journey. It's about 25 years after uh, Jesus resurrects. And I felt, you know what, this is a good study for us to do through the fall. Because the letter of Romans, it just stands as the most clearest, most systematic presentation of all of Christian doctrine that we have in the Bible. John Calvin said, what anyone gains a knowledge of Romans, they have an entrance open to them to all the most hidden treasures of scripture. Romans is what you read when you want to understand what it is that you believe. And I think Martin Luther struggled with something that most people struggle with, this burning feeling 
that no matter what you do, you're never good enough. Even if he prayed the rosary, even if he went to confession, even if he climbed the 217 steps of St. Peter's Basilica on his knees, which he did, you just don't feel forgiven. So during translating Romans, he didn't get further than 17 verses. Romans 17 says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Later, Martin Luther wrote in his own journal, When I discovered that, I was born again of the Holy Ghost. The doors of paradise swung open and I walked through. This is when we see Martin Luther beginning to write a new document, and this time, not a translation, but his own composition. He's going to write the top 10 reasons why indulgences are bad, only he's not going to stop at 10. He's going to go all the way to 95. And then he takes it to work, and then he nails it to the church door. And I'm sure that he never dreamed that he would be starting a revolution, but that was the moment. That was the beginning of the Enlightenment series. That was the time that led us all out of the Dark Ages. That's the power of the Book of Romans. In thinking about our study on Romans, I want you to remember that Paul is our author, and he was a Pharisee. Today, you and I, we might call him a lawyer, because Paul knew all the law. He knew all the do's and all the don'ts, and that's exactly how he was raised and that's also how Martin Luther was raised. So when we read Romans together, I think it might help you just to picture Paul arguing his case in court. He's going to do everything he can to present an orderly, systematic approach. And what is Paul's case? What's his argument? Well, it's clearly spelled out. And that is that salvation is by grace. It is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. That's what convinced Paul, and that's what convinced Martin Luther. The prosecuting attorney is arguing you can't pay off your debt by doing good works. The Apostle Paul pleads his case that only Christ can pay the debt, and that only by faith in the death and resurrection will your sins be wiped away. Well, you can only imagine what that did. Everything started to unravel because faith destroys religious systems. Faith destroys religious systems. What do I mean by that? Well, the church has been building a system, much like playing a giant game of Monopoly. There were rules, there were advanced rules, and there was even get-out-of-jail-free cards. But see, God had already given everybody a get-out-of-jail-free card through the cross. This is why one of the driving thoughts behind the Reformation was putting the Bible into the hands of everyone into each language for the common person so that people could begin to read the rules for themselves. They needed to see that following Christ was built on faith and not a man-made system. Because all the current religious systems, they want you to do this and do that, and then maybe God will be appeased. You know, just like the old sacrificial system, that said, God is angry, and if you do this thing, then maybe you'll appease him and he'll be okay with you, at least until the next time you mess up. But with grace, there's nothing to prove. The Olympic diver Greg Luganis, he was once asked how he could perform so well under pressure. He said, even if I blow my next dive, my mother will still love me. Luganis knew that he had nothing to prove to his mom. She loves him no matter what. And in the same way, if you've put your faith in Christ, you have nothing to prove to God. And this was the itch that Martin Luther couldn't scratch, the feeling that you're never quite good enough. People spent their whole lives conditioned by this sense that unless they constantly prove themselves, they won't receive love. Paul argues, that's not what following Christ is like. It's not about proving yourself. It's about receiving a gift that you didn't earn. Romans 1.17 again says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. 
You know, Martin Luther reads that and then he's thinking, what does that mean, as it is written? As it is written where? Paul does a great job of defending his argument for grace and faith. Paul says, you know what I'm talking about right now? It's not even new. This is found in the book of Habakkuk, which means it's in the Old Testament. Paul quotes Habakkuk to show this isn't a new thing, this isn't a New Testament thing, it's not even a Jesus thing. In fact, God is no different today than he was with Adam or Noah or Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Joseph or Moses. It's always been about faith. It has always been about faith. The author of Hebrews, another fantastic book, makes this same point. Hebrews 11 says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the immeasurable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith. It is the story of the Bible. It's always been about faith, and it always will be about faith. This is how Paul begins his argument. This is how he begins the book of Romans. He begins like any other letter. He starts with, hey, this is me right? I'm the one that's writing. And then in his next paragraph, he says, I wish I could send this letter in person. I miss you guys. I wish I, all, I wish I could visit you all. And then in verse 16, he jumps right into the reason that he's writing. He says, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul says he's eager to preach the gospel. Gospel is the Greek word euangelio, and it means good news. Or it could mean uh, to announce good news or to bring good news. It's where we get the word evangelize. Paul says, yes, I was a lawyer. I knew all the laws. I followed them religiously, right? And he says, but I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed now to preach that salvation comes from faith. Martin Luther read this and he said, yes, I am a Catholic and I am not afraid to preach that salvation cannot be purchased. It is free because faith is the gospel. Faith is the gospel. My mom tells the story about the day the Mormons came to visit her. And they told her, well, you're only partially saved. You need the Book of Mormon for the rest of the story. And she said, no, I don't. And they said, well, how do you know that? What proof do you have? And she said, Jesus. He said in John 3, 16, the very first verse we learn as children, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but the, the world would be saved through him. Paul writes the same thing to the church in Ephesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Faith is the gospel. Faith is the good news. So for the Jesus follower, it is less about earning salvation 
or proving that you belong. It is less about measuring up or following some long set of rules, and it's more about growing in your faith, right? So if it's about faith, let's grow our faith. We talked about temptations last week, and Jesus once said something about temptations, and in that teaching, he has a very popular uh, saying or popular passage about faith. It's found in Luke 17. Jesus says to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a milestone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he would be causing one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to him, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Here I think we see a very real, very raw request from the disciples. Because I think here they recognize their own humanity and they recognize their imperfections and they ask Jesus, can you increase our faith? Because Jesus tells his disciples, be a good example around others. And when someone sins against you, forgive them. And the disciples think, wow, that's a lot of work. We need help. Increase our faith so that we can obey. Because faith is our connection to God. So it stands to reason that the stronger the connection, the stronger the person. The weaker the faith, the weaker the person. So obviously we need bigger, stronger faith before we can do these difficult things that Jesus is asking. The disciples wanted to do the things that Jesus is asking. So they said, make us stronger, increase our faith. Sounds logical. But then Jesus points out this example about a mustard seed in a mulberry tree. I think he's acknowledging that the disciples are correct. It does take faith to do the things that he asks. But at the same time, Jesus says, yes, but only a very small amount of faith. Something small can still do amazing things like uprooting a rather large tree and replanting it in the middle of the ocean. When you put your faith into action, Jesus says, you're going to be amazed at what God can do through you. So yes, Jesus did some pretty incredible things, but you can do some pretty incredible things too. For instance, you don't need to wait for your faith to get bigger before you can start being a good example to others. You can do that right now. You don't have to wait for your faith to get bigger to forgive your brother or sister. You can do that right now. Even the smallest amount of faith can do big things. Do you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you do, then you have the faith that Jesus is talking about. A faith that says, yes, I know I'm a sinner, but I also know that Christ is the Son of God and that he suffered for me on the cross. He took away my, my sins and I don't earn grace. I don't purchase salvation. It was done for me. That's faith. Faith is believing that God forgives me because of Jesus. And I know where I stand with God right now because of Jesus. Jesus says you don't need to have a mountain-sized faith to live as a good example. If you have faith in Christ, even the smallest amount, God can use you. Even if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, then the sky is the limit on the type of Christian that you can be. Here's another great verse from Romans, and we will close with this. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Isn't that great? Paul tells you exactly where faith comes from. It comes from hearing the love, the promises that are found in his word. So, if you want your faith to grow, spend some time in the Bible. When you read it, pay attention to how the Bible talks about you, how God thinks about you, 
What are some of the things that God promises you? The more you understand what God has promised you, the more you will step out in faith. Remember Peter? He saw Jesus walk on water. And when you're a disciple, your ultimate goal one day is to do the things that you see your rabbi do. Well, Peter saw Jesus walk on water and he wasn't gonna wait for one day. He says, I wanna do that right now. So he asks Jesus for assurance. He said, if it's you, command me. And Jesus only said one word, come. And that's all it took. With Peter's mustard seed of faith, he did something that no human being has ever done. Can you imagine what a confidence boost that was? Peter goes from fishing in water to walking on it, all because he believed the words of his teacher and he stepped out in faith. That means for those who are willing to jump in and put the promises of God to the test, not just read God's word, but obey God's word, you're gonna to begin to discover that faith works. And you know what happens to faith that obeys? It grows. If you wanna increase your faith, you should do two things. Read God's word and obey it. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the book of Romans. We thank you for the study that we are about to take. We ask that your words speak to us, that it is your words that transform us. We know we can read these words and the Holy Spirit will interpret for them what they mean to each one of us. There is something here that's personal for each one of us that you want us to know, a way that we can grow and mature, a way that we should change maybe something that should be left behind and someone who should be forgiven. We ask that with our mustard seed faith, that you use us through our church to do great things. Maybe one day even to walk on water, following the steps of our rabbi, being a good example of Christian love and forgiving the world as it needs to be forgiven. Lord, we just ask that you continue to speak through us, embolden us to preach your message, to boldly evangelize without shame or without fear, and to continue to tell others that the good news is your son, and that faith in his death and resurrection brings eternal life for all, amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us this morning. Of course, uh, you can always clip and copy the address at the top there and post it to your own social media walls and let other people know what it was that you watched this morning. And of course, we'd love you to be here with us. Uh, we have two services every single Sunday, one at 9.30. We've got a choir. We're gonna sing uh, hymns out of the hymnal. We're gonna do responsive reading, say the Lord's Prayer, have communion. It's everything that you remember church to be when you grew up. Our second service is at 11. It's much more casual, come however you feel comfortable. And we have a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. We wanna be the church where you live. I'll see you guys soon, bye.